Welcome to the Alouettes Flight Deck, the podcast dedicated to Montreal Alouettes football. I'm Cliffy D. You can find me on X at Cliffy D. And I'm Tim Capper. You can also find me on X at Repact. That's R-E-P-P-A-C-T. And this episode of the podcast is presented by our good friends over at SportBuff, where if you use the code Al's Flight Deck 10 at checkout, you will save 10% off the entire order. So head over to sportbuffshop.com, use the code, save 10%, support local, and come away with some great, great merch. And the LOS Flight Deck is all over the World Wide Web and social media. Make sure you check out our archive of our seven plus seasons on on the podcast over at www.alouettesflightdeck.ca. Make sure you give us a follow on X at Alouettes FL Deck. Check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Alouettes Flight Deck pod. Uh, make sure you check out our Instagram as well at Alouettes Flight Deck and also threads at Alouettes Flight Deck. Uh, you can also find all of our episodes, all of our uh, Flight Deck lives on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Alouettes Flight Deck. And we are very excited to announce we have a new website address for our store, our merch store. Uh, make sure you head over to www.flightdeckgear.ca and check out all the amazing stuff that we have on sale. A lot easier for you folks to find it. And also, too, that tea giving promo code is still on the website as well. So make sure you check that. And we're not on TikTok. So if you're looking for us there, you're going to be <laughs> SOL. <laughs> Yeah, the, that uh, that uh, URL was a long time coming. And uh, again, you have until the 30th, the 30th in order to use the tea giving 23 uh, uh, coupon to save 10%. Even though you won't get your, your shirts in time for our, our fan meetup uh, on Thanksgiving Monday. Um, but uh, still, you'll be able to wrap the, 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 you know, the show at any time you can. So yeah. Um, I- and we are seeing a lot of traction. A lot of people are buying up the the shirts and ordering them. And I, I'm hoping for everybody that they get their shirt on time for Thanksgiving Monday, so that they can be a, come and be a part of the fan meetup over at uh, Percival Molson Stadium. It's it's going to be awesome. We're we're so excited for this, and we're excited to see each and every one of you come and rock your flight deck shirts. Yeah, and we're getting together our last bits of. Uh, things that we, you know, all, all the information and, and the details that we want to do, but I, we were looking at potentially doing a a raffle for one of the Delta, uh, one of the Delta jackets that we have in our possession. Um, we're looking to invite some uh, former Alouettes alumni to just to drop by and say hey. And obviously, we got the uh, the the picture taking of everybody in their shirts. So uh, uh, stay tuned to all of our socials for some more information as uh, as it comes available. Absolutely. I know we've been looking to try to get a perfect week when it comes to, you know, playing 60 minutes of football cliff. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't all, it wasn't perfect this week versus the Calgary Stampeders, but it was very damn close to being a very perfect week. Wasn't it? Yeah, it, it, it felt like this team really needed to turn to turn a corner. I mean, I think they had to realize, okay, we just finished a four-game stretch against arguably the best teams in the Canadian Football League and came up snake eyes. It happens. I mean, the better team won each of those games. There's there's simply no question about that. Mm-hmm. The LOS really had to find some way to get off the schneid. They had to figure something out. They had to stop this losing streak by any means necessary. And... Calgary was coming in off the bye. They too were in a bit of a desperate situation. They've got to really get their act together if they want to even hope to make the playoffs. I mean, they've been a, a part of the playoff picture since I think the last time they missed the playoffs was 2007, if I'm not mistaken, or that was the last time they were losing a record. I think I, it's it's been a long time since the the Calgary Stampeders weren't in the playoff conversation, and they needed this win this past Saturday just as badly as what Montreal did. But uh, ultimately, it's Fair, fair to say that the better team won this past Saturday out in McMahon Stadium. No, it, yeah, it's true. And, you know, like we were saying on Flight Deck Live on our post game show, is that, you know, we've been very lucky to have the defense that we've had for the past couple of weeks. You know, obviously with the additions of Sankey and uh, with Lemon, the, the defense has just gotten better and better and better. And it's, it's, 
uh, it's been a sleeper type of defense for most of the season. We've had our issues, obviously, with the uh, with the offense, but the defense has always been able to keep us in, in most of the games that we've played this year. You know, whether we, have, you know, no matter who we've played, you know, and no matter what the score was, um, but this this defense stepped up again this game, uh, coupled with obviously what the offense was able to do. And the Owls are able to walk away with a 28 to 11 win over the, over the Stampeders, you know, and, and holding, you know what, Cliff, for the Owls to hold the Stampeders to 11 points, which is the second least amount of points uh, that the Stamps have scored versus the Alouettes in their history at McMahon is just a, a, a thing of beauty in itself. It really is. And when you think about it, I mean, they basically slammed the door on the Stampeders in the second half. Uh, essentially, the scoring was fairly equal in the in the first half. But in that second half, this defense just clamped right down and made Calgary's life miserable. The best they could, uh, they could do in the second half was a R- Rene Perez field goal. That's it. They, they just couldn't get anything going. And just when you start, you, you 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 thought this team had signs of life. Uh, this defense once again just came knocking and just made Jake Mayer's life miserable. Simply put, I mean, Marc Antoine de Croix was just an absolute thorn in his side. I, I, I mean, whether it was with the interception in the end zone or even that that last ditch attempt to try and score a touchdown on their final series, and he just bats the ball away, like just swats it out of the air like a mosquito. It was just simply incredible. Like Marc Antoine de Croix was definitely all over the place uh, this past Saturday. And I'm, I'm telling you, like this guy really, truly is making his case as far as most outstanding Canadian player or, or even most outstanding defensive player for the uh, Alouettes. That's true. And uh, it really, by the way, I know you're calling it interception. Yeah, it was interception, but you know what? It was actually a reception. <laughs> it, 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 it's like well, Jake Mayer just threw the ball directly over to, to MAD. I mean, really. If he... If you didn't know better, you would have sworn he was throwing it right at uh, <laughs> at Manonk. It, it, it was it was hilarious. Or Dequa was just smart enough to like just stay behind the goalpost and then just at the last second, woo! Here, here appears a Marc Antoine Dequa with yep. the ball in his hands. Like, yeah, I know, a, a, yeah. absolutely outstanding. And it just whatever momentum they were trying to build in Calgary just got snuffed out like that, just mm-hmm. out cold. And then yep. then Cody Fajardo and 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 his team took over and. Did what they did, yeah. And the the defense took took advantage of of being able to stop Calgary when they needed to, especially when they were in uh, you know were, were there in the green zone. Um, it all started in in the first quarter, you know, with uh, today's special guest, and we're going to be interviewing Sean Lemon. So stay tuned to that one. That was yep. a that was a. F- a fun one and an interesting one, and uh, I will I will say this now. I know because most of you will be obviously going to be listening to this uh, on audio. If you do get the chance, because we are going to be releasing it on video format, the interview itself as a standalone, mm-hmm. just wait. That's all. All I could say is uh, it's probably one of the most unique places I've ever interviewed uh, a player or anybody that, for me in my history too of doing all the all all these interviews. It was probably one of the most unique places I've ever had a, a player doing an interview. So, <laughs> I, I would have to agree with that uh, m- for myself as well. I mean, I've, I've talked with a lot of football players in a lot of different scenarios. I can truly say I've never talked to a football player in this particular scenario. So, by all means, folks, when <laughs> when, when we when we put this on YouTube, definitely give it a check because yeah. I mean, I, I always say we've got faces uh, for podcasts, but I mean suffer through it and just check out the interview. I, we were so happy to be able to talk with Sean. He's just a great dude. And like, it was just an absolutely wonderful time. There, there's no question about that. So yeah. by all means, stay tuned for that. Yeah. And so, and it all started with which lemons, you know, interception, you mm-hmm. know, it, it was Calgary was driving and uh, I honestly think that the Owls got away with an offsides on that play, by the way. I have not talked to you about that one. It was very close. Very, very close. close. Very close. Um, and but, it's funny because but, they also had an offside earlier, like earlier in the series as well. So yeah. like some, a couple of guys were feeling froggy on that particular play. I don't know if it was nerves. I don't know if they were just you know amped up a little too much Red Bull. I don't know what it was, but they, yeah, somebody was a little bit jittery and, 
yeah, I'll, I'll say it. The Alouettes got away with just a, like uh, by the hair, just by the hair of their chinny chin chin. Like that's how close it was with this offside call that kind of went, you know, uncalled. But I mean, the refs can't catch everything, unfortunately. No, and it can't be challenged. So, right. I mean, maybe it was, it was a perfect snap of all, but either way, it led to the interception. The Alouettes stopped, stopped Calgary. It was, you know, it was a a scoreless first quarter for both teams. Um, you know, unfortunately, and this seems to be a thing with the Alouettes, Cliff, and usually, I, I don't know, do you determine when it comes to how successful a team can be based on how they do on their first drives of the game? How much, how much, do you how much stock do you put into that? Because you know the Alouettes this year have been kind of meh. You know they have. I think they've only gotten three touchdowns on their first drives all season. Do, you, do you, is that uh, is that something that you really look at when it comes to e- football in general? When it, to how successful a team can be? Not really. At least not in the Canadian Football League because it's ultimately the last three minutes that truly determine a football game. I mean, it, I, I'm all for trying to set the tone. I'm all for trying to establish dominance try to establish a rhythm right away because sometimes that's all it takes and once you get that ball rolling it's almost impossible for it to stop but first drives are not something i tend to take as you know this is a precursor of things to Mm -hmm. come i Mm -hmm. you know i mean it's great as far as setting up momentum or could go terribly wrong i mean I've, i've seen a lot of drives go like that as well but it all depends. It depends on the team, depends on the players, but uh, no, it's not something I definitely take a whole lot of consideration into myself, but uh, I, yeah. I, I mean, it, you just never know. It, it t- totally depends on the team, totally depends on the players, but uh, no, it's not something I, I, I would tend to take as, you know, is this a, a precursor of things to come? Is this something we can expect for the rest of the afternoon? No, that that's typically not me. Yeah, and and and, and I think you think you said it, it's usually about momentum too. I think if the team wants to have momentum, um, usually after a kickoff or something like that. I think the Owls actually did it in Week One. I think rather you know versus Ottawa, they scored an opening uh, drive touchdown. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, again, the Owls were able to um again after a scoreless first quarter there they were able to get things going dude i mean it's as i said it was a very close game at halftime it was 11 8 um it, the owls just as i said uh, the, the defense i think carried this game but the uh, but finally the the offense given the opportunities that it was given was able to finally step and actually get some offensive points on the board yeah it was kind of like a uh you know like like a, a locomotive engine. Like sometimes it takes a little while for it to warm up and to start chugging along, and that's really what it felt like. The, the first first two quarters of this game were kind of meandering a little bit. Like I think both teams were trying to fill each other out and see, you know, what moves they had to make, what adjustments what they would have had to make for the second half. But uh, yeah, uh, once Cody got going, I mean, he wasn't perfect by any stretch, but uh, once he got going, he started connecting with the receivers. He was starting to move the ball downfield and. I think he needed a game like this. He needed a game where he didn't have to overthink anything. He didn't have to be the hero. He didn't have to do anything outstanding. He didn't have to make those uh, home run shots or anything like that. All he did with one, an absolute beauty of a bomb to Tyson Philpot, who should have had that touchdown, quite yeah. frankly. But yeah, well. <laughs> but aside, but aside from aside from that though, like he did, he. I, I I know I hate using this term game manager, but he managed the game properly for the most part. I mean he made his reads. He definitely connected with the receivers, was not afraid to hand the ball off to William Stanback or to uh, Jeshua Nantui. Like he, he took care of the game and sometimes that makes for boring football. But I think after losing the, your last four games, I think Cody was desperate to get back on track to really get back to what makes him such a good quarterback. And that's just take care of the game, take care of the ball. Don't overthink things and just, have the faith in your receivers to make the catch. Have the faith in your running back to go and get those 10 yards that are needed. And even though he went for a little run on himself, himself, and I, I really wish he'd just keep that in check a little bit, but I mean, that's, <laughs> that's just the kind of player he is. He's, he's like, he's got that gunslinger mentality. He's got that, you know, he wants to put this team on his back and be the hero. And I, I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that sort of gumption, but at the same time, Sometimes you just take care of the little things. And really, that's what this team needs to do more than anything else. Is just take care of the little things, and the rest will fall into place. And we got to see that this past Saturday against Calgary. And he didn't have the yips. 
you know, the only yes, it, it could have been a debil- uh, debilitating interception that he threw in the third quarter. But you know, this this was still a, an Alouettes team that was up, and it and it didn't. I think again, the defense was able to do what they needed to do. So it's, I think the Owls scored the most points off of turnovers, if I'm not mistaken, in this game, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's. Yeah, again, as I said, the one interception really didn't hurt the Alouettes at all. Um, and I don't know. I said the history of the Alouettes in Calgary, though, Cliff, man. I mean, I think they had gone in uh, losing their last uh, eight of nine, if I'm not mistaken, or nine of ten, something something to that effect. I, I think it was nine of ten. Yeah. Like, the and last, last just, time they won in Calgary was 2019. Yeah. Yeah, and ever we, since we, then, like they played some really closely contested affairs, but uh, over yeah, they, time this, and did it, the 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 almost win by Gino, the comeback with Gino, but just out of bounds type of thing. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, again, this is the team needed what they need what they needed to do. And but the thing is, though, Cliff, you know, it's something that we have been talking about um, as supporters over the past couple of weeks is that the, the for some reason, no matter what the score has been. And it seems that no matter who we have in the backfield, that the Alouettes were not taking advantage of what we had in the backfield and put it within the game plan properly. It always turned it into a pass, 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 pass type of game. I, I get that when you're down a lot, you know, like they were to uh, to Toronto or to Winnipeg or you know stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But the, the Owls did it right this time, dude. You know, they were able to get the running game going. And when you get, you know, when you get our guy, William Stanback, you give him 14 attempts. He gives you 81 yards, which is almost an, a, a six average, which is 5.8. Mm-hmm. You know you're doing something really, really well. Because yep. Stanback showed up and really, uh, he he did what we expected of William Stanback. And for Ed, mm-hmm. by the way, this was his first return to Calgary since his injury last year. Yeah. So you you had to believe he had this date circled on his calendar for a long, long time. He wanted to show what he could do. And boy, did he ever. I mean, as you said, just outstanding running, uh, scoring a touchdown as well. Essentially, what was the game-winning touchdown uh, late in the fourth or in the fourth quarter? I mean, mm-hmm. just... You could see the the look on his face. You could see the the absolute joy, the relief. Like, okay, I got that monkey off my back. As far as you know, like, you know, what what happened in Calgary before? That's in the past. That's a distant memory. Like today, right now, he was the man. Like that 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 was his mindset, and he sure was. He was actually nominated as the uh, Budweiser Player of the Game. So, yep. kudos to him for that. Not a not a surprise at all. Definitely well deserved. Uh, yeah, he 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 really sh- he really played an outstanding game and really was a big factor in this win. Yep, uh, Cody Fajardo, uh, hey, dude, another great game from him. Twenty two of twenty nine for two hundred fifty two yards, uh, interception and a touchdown. I mean, I mean, it was what needed to be done. Um, again, getting it out to different receivers and something that we have been talking about over the past couple of weeks. And you mentioned Tyson earlier. If there's finally some sort of chemistry between between Cody and Tyson. You know, I mean, Tyson led the team again in receiving yards this week. You know, f- uh, four receptions on five targets for 87 yards. That almost touched down. Um, it's it's great to finally see you know, with Tyson being on the field uh, just continuous, continuously now ever since coming off the sixth game, how much these two have gotten it together. And it puts more of a, you know, it takes a little bit off of Austin Mack, mm-hmm. but again, it gives us another deep threat. And all these, all these first year guys that have come in basically have have stood up and stood out the entire year. Yeah, no, it, this was the connection that we were expecting to see in training camp, and uh, didn't quite happen that first part of the season. But like into the 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 latter st- stages of the season, like like when the games truly count. This is when you want to see Cody Fajardo connecting with a, a Tyson Philpot. And mm-hmm. I think he truly does realize, oh my gosh, I got quite the weapon here. Like, yeah, Austin Mack is definitely, I would say, his preferred target and probably his first look. Uh, Tyler Sneed definitely makes those clutch catches and once again is proving that this guy really is Ben Cahoon 3.0. I mean, like, just my God. I mean, he small guy that just you can't measure heart. That's the thing is you, you can't measure heart because. He's just got so much of it. Like this guy is just an absolute baller. But 
now you throw Tyson Philpot into that mix along with Kayon Julian Grant. I, I mean, my God. I mean, like this team definitely has weapons. Like everybody was laughing about how the Alouettes had no receivers after Jake Winicky and Gino Lewis left in free agency. Well, I will put up those four names that I talked about. Austin Mack, Tyler Sneed, Tyson Philpott, and Kayon Julian Grant up against any other receiving core in the Canadian Football League. And are they the best? Debatable, but they can hang with these guys. They, they You give these guys the opportunity. You throw them the ball. They are going to make magic happen. And that's what you want out of your receiving core. And it's coming together at the exact right time. Like This is when you want to see where your football players are. You want to see where your, your talent is. And we're seeing a lot of talent. And the fact that Cody is able to have that connection now with Tyson Philpott couldn't have come in a better time as far as I'm concerned. Yep. And uh, second leading receiver for the game was Tyler Sneed. Uh, six receptions, seven targets for 83 yards. And one of those included, and I wasn't able to do the, the, the you know, bad Tim. I wasn't able to do the, 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 uh, the research that I wanted to do, but it also included that uh, that very unique uh, penalty, which we had not heard about, which was that the grade two spearing penalty, which cost um, uh, Mega and the Stampeders 25 yards on that one play. Yeah, I'm actually really surprised he wasn't ejected from the game as a result because, I mean, I, first of all, I've never even heard of grade two spearing. I mean, that's in the NCAA, that would be called targeting, actually. Uh, NFL, I don't think they have... I don't even know if they go by that. I, like I say, it's not something you hear very much of, if at all. I didn't even know that was even a thing. Like, just... Mm-hmm. It was clear as day, Michael Awe definitely led with his the crown of his helmet, and he was head, he was headhunting. Simple as that. He was obviously trying to take out Tyler Sneed with that hellacious hit. Uh, absolutely no need for that, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Michael Awe is... A hell of a football player he he plays extremely hard uh he's definitely someone that you want on your defense but at the same time not with plays like that let's just i, I mean i don't want to say anything untoward but plays like that are not going to win anyone any favors okay real quick clarification there are five different penalties with under the 25 yard uh heading Grade two roughing the passer, grade two spearing, rough play. Which isn't that what they gave Austin? Anyways, I'll digress. Um, physical abuse of an official, and then spitting. You get DQ'd, and we've heard of this before. You can get DQ'd for spitting also. Right. Physical abuse of an official, so that falls under the other one. Mm-hmm. Two player misconduct fouls which we both know about hazardous equipment what does that mean i can only imagine (laughs) don't wear that acid on your head uh rough play excessive objectionable conduct excessive objectionable conduct and then two grade two fouls huh interesting it it is it is to me though i i'm I'm curious, based off the Austin Mack ejection uh, for that alleged punch that he threw mm-hmm. in Toronto, like I, I'm still baffled as to how, if you were to put that up compared to what Michael Alway did, I mean, I don't see a whole lot of difference other than the fact that Always looked a lot more intentional than what Max did, and Mack ended up getting thrown out of the game, whereas Alway continued to play in the game this past Saturday. So... It's the wheel of justice, folks. You spin it, and you don't know where it lands. <laughs> it's funny how you determine a uh, rough play is 25 yards or if it's considered disqualification. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But anyways, so yeah, so Sneed was able to get up from that one. Um, but, but again, again, it, it just the ball was... And what's funny is KGT first came back, didn't, didn't get a reception. He got a target. Sorry, second game back. I didn't, and only one target, no yards. You know, so I mean, it, everything was. Speaker got into it. Stanbeck got got into it also, and Austin Mack, you know, forty one yards on uh, eight targets and four receptions. So, yeah, uh, still yeah. leading the league in, in in reception yards is uh, the Big Mac. So, my gosh, so, what a 
And it, it's so funny this week uh, on Twitter, like uh, I think it was TSN edge had mentioned about uh, the potential of Austin Mack winning rookie of the year. I'm like, just, and just about everybody and their mother came on, on board to say, he's not eligible for that. <laughs> unfortunately. And it, it sucks because yeah, you, you look at the numbers that Mac is putting up and they're absolutely phenomenal for a first year player. That's incredible. But unfortunately due to his NFL experience, he does not qualify for, you know, being nominated as rookie of the year. I'll, uh, unfortunately. If any of the trophy companies out there want to make us a trophy for the, for, for the uh, flight deck awards, uh, award of the year, uh, I'll be more than happy to give him the rookie of the year. <laughs> Yep. You know uh, our, our rookie trophy. And you so, know what? I, I, I bet Austin would be thrilled. I'd be I think he'd be honored. I'd like to think he would be. He, you know, friend of the show. So I mean what we we'll we'll give him his flowers. If if the league doesn't want to do that, then fine. We'll we will recognize him as the generational talent that he truly has become. Maybe add maybe the, the I know we're gonna be talking about our potentially our, our, our choices in the next coming weeks for who we would choose for the league uh for the league uh, uh awards but maybe, maybe they should throw in first you know t- since they're not eligible because they played in the nfl a first year but not rookie of a year award so Something. newcomer Na- na- most, name out- most outstanding newcomer that's that hey, that's a good way of putting it i like that i mean yeah because his first year in the CFLs, but not technically a rookie. So that would be interesting. New, newcomer. And then that way anybody can qualify, whether they're a uh, global player, American player, national player. I mean, and start doing, maybe start doing comeback, comeback player of the year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? So anyways, but uh, you know, no, note to self to contact the Seattle head office and we'll 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 we'll, we'll put this in a, a politely worded letter and we'll yeah, our people will we'll, we'll, we'll make sure one of we'll make sure one of uh, Randy Ambrosi's underlings at least acknowledges it. Yeah, our people will contact your people. Um, what else do you want to talk about this game, man? I mean, I said the defense just was everywhere, everywhere. You know, it wasn't the, I mean, Joseph Zima and, and David Cote, you know, Cote was back on being David Cote, uh, you know, the guy that In we In a good knew. way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, let's, let's qualify this because unfortunately he does seem to, he still gets dragged for every time he bricks a field goal, which is unfortunate or, and people are even blaming him somehow for the blocked field goal. I mean, how, how the hell do you blame the kicker for a blocked field goal? Uh, Stuff happens. What do you, what do you? I don't I get that energy, and it, it just comes down to like kickers. Uh, you l- either love them or hate them. I think, and I think there's just no middle ground anymore when it comes to kickers. And that's fair or not. That's just that's just the way it is. I mean, yeah. what, 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 what are you going to do about that? But no, you're I, right. David, I, Co- David Cote was back to being the David Cote we've come to expect and appreciate, and yeah. he made kicks and he did very well. As did Joseph yeah. Zima with his punts. Uh, defense, Sean Lemon, two quarterback sacks, just one away from reaching the triple digits in his career. Uh, the Alice had four, yep, the four sacks overall. And on the biggest, hugest positive note, I think, for the, for the game itself, besides the win, Cliff, is that the Alouette's O-line allowed Cody to stay upright the entire game. They did not allow an entire sack all game yeah which makes his one interception all the more maddening because he had plenty of time and space in the pocket he was able to make his reads and that, it was almost that, it was almost telegraphed that pass is the always they almost seem to be telegraphed yeah yeah i mean listen sometimes it happens sometimes you think you've got the read and you go for it and you know the the receiver or the defender jumps the route and next thing you know it's being it's going back to the other side what are you going to do but by and large fajardo uh, yeah credit to the soul line because they really gave cody the the time and space to do th- do good things they were able to create lanes for william standback to get a lot of his uh, his rushing yards they they definitely played a very very solid game out in calgary this past week Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Calgary only had three penalties. Alouettes had nine. 
Um, I'm trying to see some of the other stuff here. I mean, there, there are some others too. I think we had a, a, a contacting the kicker penalty, uh, which it you know it, it is it is a it is a little frustrating. But they they really did just not just one, not just two, Cliff, but three play, three Alouette special teamers just literally just ran over their over their kicker. I mean, it was it wasn't even one of those one of those ones you're like, come on, no, it was it was. There, there was no question that he got he got he got roughed. Run, he got run. Yeah, yeah, he got something. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't necessarily want to call him out either. You know, don't, I hope it's not taken as such. But Reggie Stubblefield has been absolutely outstanding this year. Definitely, you know, plays with his heart on his sleeve. Definitely plays outstanding football. But that roughing the passer penalty on him was got the the diving for the knees. That was ill advised. Uh, we we could have done without that, and I I, I want to believe Reggie's a lot better than that. Like I I just I don't know if it was just the heat of the moment kind of thing. I don't know what happened there, but uh, yeah, that there, there's never a good time to take a rough in the passer penalty, and I I hope Reggie realizes that and learns from that experience. I hope I hope he takes that as a teachable moment as to don't don't aim for the knees. I mean, if you're gonna tackle the quarterback, tackle the quarterback. You may get called for roughing the passer because you know if you just you know breathe on them the wrong way, they 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 want to throw the flag. But don't mm. don't take a guy out of the knees like that. That's that's not football. That's not good football. And yeah. I, I I truly believe Stubblefield is better than that. I just want to believe that was you know just I said a brain cramp on his part, or maybe just you know maybe the way he fell. It just you know any number of reasons why that that play went down the way it did. But uh, yeah, it was definitely an unfortunate penalty for him to take. Um, any last words for, for the game itself? I mean, obviously with the win, the Alouettes, uh, uh, the, even their record at seven and seven, they are now two games up. So four points up on the Hamilton Tiger cats, uh, in the CFL East. Um, obviously we have, we'll be talking about it in a couple of minutes, uh, after the interview and we start previewing the game versus the Ottawa Red Blacks in the first game of the home and home. Um, but you know, they, uh, it was a win that they needed. I talked to you, I think, on the post game show on Playtech Live. I said, you know, what is it? Was it right to call it a must win? And you, yeah, we. I think we both agreed it, it was a mu- it was a must win game for the Alouettes. Um, but uh, I mean, for Calgary to, too, like they they too were oh. also in in a playoff hunt, and this loss definitely dealt them a blow for sure. I mean, they're not eliminated yet, but I mean they've. <laughs> they've got their work cut out for them. I mean, they've had a, they even had a couple of great scenarios line up for them with uh, uh, BC beating uh, Edmonton. And uh, uh, I think it was uh, with Ottawa beating Saskatchewan. I mean that if somehow Calgary were able to get the win, they, they'd be in a much better spot. Whereas right now, because of the loss to Montreal, I mean, they, they're not, they're not out yet, but they, they got a long, long road ahead and they, they got to get something figured out like yesterday if they want want to have any shot of making the playoffs they got they got to get their act together in 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 the worst possible way i know i know we said we don't give usually give out game balls but i mean just uh for for my last comment on on the game itself i'm going to give props obviously for to darnell sankey uh 10 total tackles in this game dude again something about this defense has changed with the addition of Sean Lemon and with Darnell Sankey. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what type of schemes uh, coach Noel Thorpe has, has changed or modified with these two guys in the game. Now, uh, I, I mean, on the defensive side of the ball now, I don't know, but whatever it is, keep it up because uh, these guys, uh, you know, these guys have helped. They brought some veteran presence to, to the, to the, uh, to the team itself. And it's, it's worked out very well. For me, it would have to be Lawal Ugalak. I mean, that guy was just all over the place, and he was definitely a menace as well. Bang uh, on, baby. I agree. Two two tag two tackles for a loss, a quarterback sack of his own. He was batting down balls. I mean, he I mean, for a rookie, my God. I mean, that like this kid has really, really come into his own the past couple of weeks. And look at the guys he's playing with. I mean, he's being mentored by the Armando Sewells, the Sean Lemons, uh, Darnell Sankey. I mean, like he's he's being surrounded by some championship caliber experience, and that's only going to be a good thing for this young man. I mean, uh, you you see what he done? Like this is again. Let's not forget first round draft pick this year, and he is 
really coming into his own again at the best possible time. And it's he all came in good. late too. He came in late too because remember he was in an NFL camp originally. Right. Yeah, he came. He came to training camp late, but and we didn't hear a whole lot of him to start the season. But like right now, like as I said, this is the time when you make hay. This is the time when you start. You have to start winning football games, and this is when you see where your stars are. And this young man is really starting to come alive. You know, over the past couple of weeks, he has really shown he really belongs on this team. And my goodness, it it couldn't have come at a better time. Like I said, with with, with that kind of experience on this defensive line that we have, and then this young man comes in and doesn't look out of place whatsoever. Absolutely outstanding. Like the, as they say, the ri- the rich get richer, and that's exactly what this defensive line is for the Montreal Alouettes. Yeah. Uh, speaking of defense, Cliff, we teased it a little bit earlier in the show. Uh, we had uh, quite a uh, par- quite an interview with uh, with one of our defensive leaders, didn't we? We sure did. Uh, very excited to be able to talk to this man uh, coming over to Montreal uh, and just making an impact almost immediately. And it was an absolute blast to be able to talk with him. So now, without further ado, let's go to our interview with number zero for the Montreal Alouettes, Sean Lemon. Ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to be joined by a member of the Montreal Alouette's stellar defense, a man who is on the cusp of reaching 100 quarterback sacks in his career. We are very pleased and very happy to be joined tonight by number zero of the Montreal Alouette's, Sean Lemon. Sean, welcome to the Alouette's Flight Deck. Uh, Thanks for having me, guys. Sorry for this... uh... The background, I'm getting my work done. I usually get work, uh, massage work done. It's up during the week to prepare for the game. So I uh, just wanted to make that be known first. <laughs> it's all good. Oh, it's 100%. all good. You, 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 you got to take care of yourself. And if you don't take care of yourself, who will, right? Most definitely. Most definitely. This is all a part of the process. Now, I'm going to ask first off before we get to, to the hard hitting, hard, hard hitting stuff. Uh, do you really like being number zero? Oh yeah, I love it. I love yeah. it. Uh, it was actually a number that I request uh, before I signed. So yeah, oh, no, I okay. enjoy it. I enjoy the number a lot. Okay. okay. Any specific meaning behind it, or just you just like the number zero? No, just you know, um, I kind of actually there's a little meaning behind it, but it's not much. But uh, just looked at guys like uh, I'm a huge basketball guy, so I looked at guys like. Davey Lillard, uh, Russell Westbrook, uh, they wear the number zero, Gilbert Arenas, guys that have been, I feel like those guys have been overlooked a lot in their career uh, with, with the production that they have. So just kind of wanted to go with that route. Okay. Um, that works. Yeah, can't can't so, complain about that. Yeah, 100%. So let's talk about last Saturday. How sweet was it going up against your former team, a team that essentially decided you weren't good enough to be to keep around to go and have an absolutely outstanding football game like you did. Oh yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, I mean, it's I don't even think it's to that level of them not thinking that I wasn't good enough to keep around. It's just you know for, I'm not entitled to anything. Um, they decided to go with who they went with. I can't control those things. I can only control what I can do on the field, but. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't an extra chip on my shoulder when I got there. Especially that first INT, that that must have been absolutely outstanding just to be able to snatch that out of the thin air, basically. Yeah, yeah, no, it was good. It was actually a play that uh, we worked on, like, with Coach Thorpe. Um, he has, does a great job of game planning for us. It's a play that I made in practice about probably about four or five times since I've been here. And um, just taking the drills to the field, I knew the ball had to come out in you know 1.5 seconds, or the quarterback was going to get sacked. Uh, so I just wanted to get my hands up at the big gap, and I got a surprise to wait for me when I did. I mean, also too, I think I, I think we heard you post game too. You were saying I think it was on the the Owls post game show. You were talking about how you wish you had gotten 100 there, but obviously you had the the chance to become you know to reach that Century Club this week versus Ottawa. I mean, are are you really are you the type of player, Sean, who who is a, a stats guy through and through throughout your career, or is it is this just an, another you know uh, milestone that you're going to be glad to, to achieve? No, I'm a stats guy. <laughs> I'm a stats guy. <laughs> I, I understand the 
the nuances. I'm a football guy, junkie. I love everything about the game of football. I love everything about the game of CFL football. So, uh, yeah, no, I am. I, I'm definitely a stats guy. I know it's only been like uh, 12 players in CFL history to reach 100 sacks. So it was always something that I've always wanted to do. I got to share the moment with Odell Willis at Ottawa in the 20, was that 20, the year before the pandemic. What year was that? 2019? 2019. Was that 19? Yeah. 2019 when he did it at Ottawa. So something that me and him talked about throughout the week this week. So uh, definitely a uh, stack guy. So so history has a way of repeating itself or potentially has a chance to repeat itself. It does. I feel like I was there with him in that moment. Um, I've learned a lot from uh, Odell Willis as his plan style and just how he approaches the game. And for me to be there uh, when he reached 100 sacks, it was very motivating for me. And right after he did it, uh, one of the first words he told me was, I was next. So let's see what happens. Yes. <laughs> it's close. We're so close. We can taste it, man. It's it, it's coming. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. That's wild. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, what we were curious to know about is that obviously, you know, we, we knew we were in camp with BC this year. And, yeah, you, you didn't make the roster. And. You know, for not only for us Owls fans, and I'm sure our fans across the, the CFO would want to know, was why did you, why were you basically not picked up right there and then? I mean, was it something that uh, you wanted to bide your time? Was it something you wanted to work on? Or was it just a matter of you, you wanted to find the right fit, the right team that you wanted to join before you, okay. before you I said, said really yes? Answer that question. That's a, a question for the general managers of the league or. You know, guys like to, they liked that, a great camp in BC. I don't understand why I was, it wasn't a talent thing, but, um, you know, it is what it is. I'm not entitled to anything. They wanted to go with who they went with and um, other teams. It's just, you know, I'm just waiting for a phone call. And then after a while, phone calls start heat up. Then uh, I just wanted to decide the best fit for me. And I've been watching all the games, so. I liked what Coach Thorpe was doing with the defense here, and I feel like I would have been a great asset here, and that's what I went with. And obviously, ever since signing with the Isle of Wets, it, you've just been balling out. I mean, it's, it, you have made one hell of a difference on that defense from what, what the Isle of Wets defense was earlier in the season. You just complimented it perfectly. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks, man. It's, uh, like I said, Coach, Coach Corbin Irving, Coach Quick, Coach Thorpe, those guys do a great job of preparing me for games and understanding when I can take my shots and when I can, uh, you know, do the things that I'm great at. So it really a testament to those guys and my teammates for, you know, just, you know, doing their part as well. Now you got some young studs on this defensive line. Uh, do you feel like you have to kind of help them? Do you feel like you're also brought in to help them along as well in their progression? Or is it just a matter of I can work with these guys? Like they're going to compliment me just like I'm going to compliment them. Yeah, we compliment each other well. It's not a, uh, you know, me just helping everybody with things. They help me with things as well. Um, but I do have a lot of knowledge uh, with the things that I've done in my career. So I try to pass on that knowledge to these guys as well. Um, just to help him out. Like you see development of uh, Lou Wall. He's uh, starting to become into his own. He, he sits by me in the meetings. He's, uh, you know, trying to learn everything he can. And, you know, it's working for him. Yeah, that that kid is dangerous. I mean, he is really, like the past couple of weeks, he's really come alive. And playing alongside of you, I mean, that that just is such a natural, like peanut butter and jelly just goes so well together. <laughs> no, it's confidence. That's what I told him. One thing I told him is, it takes time, you know, it's confidence and reps. It's you believing in the moves that you work on in practice and that translate to the games. And he's been putting that work in, and I feel like he's only scratching the surface of what he can be. Who's the uh, who's the person uh, that you have learned the most from uh, since you've been in Montreal? Since I've been in Montreal? Um, yeah, yeah. I would say Coach Thorpe. Uh, he, he showed me different ways on how to affect the game. Um, outside of just sacking the quarterback, knocking down passes, um, intercepting passes. This is probably the most knockdowns that I've ever had in my career. Uh, this is probably the most interceptions that I've ever had in the same season. So I would say him, Coach Thorpe, he's been uh, very uh, influential in my, my game so far this year. 
would you say he was instrumental in you coming to Montreal, or is it just strictly a negotiation between yourself and Danny Machocha? No, he was there. Yeah, he had a lot to do with that. Uh, coach Corbin Irvin, I haven't played with him. He's our defensive line coach. Uh, so I really felt comfortable with him. I know I could uh, trust him. I I know how his football, I know the, the things that he teach translates to my game. So I just felt really comfortable. Coach Boss, I was around him in 2015 in Ottawa. So I know what type of guy he is. And uh, just getting to know Danny Machocha as well, I just felt really comfortable. Uh, Mondo Sewell being here, uh, we were college roommates. Uh, we went to college together active for four years. So it was a perfect fit. Both former Zips, impressive. Now, you are mentioning it before, uh, Sean. You are talking about, you know, your career itself. So, obviously, you've had a career that spanned, uh, you know, multiple football teams in multiple leagues. I just learned today you played in, in indoor football, which I had no clue you had done. Um, what what actually is keeping you motivated, uh, you know, to continue to play at such a high level? I just, my passion for the game. Um, just, I like to, you know, Prove guys wrong. It's you know, for me to be sitting out uh, as long as I've been sitting out. I'm at like what fifth in the league in sacks. I've been seven weeks this season. So you know, I just love doing that. I love doing the unthinkable. So it's fun as long as I'm having fun, and you know, it's it's a part of my DNA. So you know, just keep playing. When my production stops, that's when I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. Now your your time here in Montreal so far has been nothing short of outstanding uh what's been the biggest takeaway you've had from this team in just the i think it's like seven eight weeks ago you've been to, with this team now what's the biggest takeaway you've gotten from these guys to this date this is a group of guys who uh blue collar like myself come to work work hard every day enjoy being around each other um just even from the coaches we you know we're very competitive at everything we do from it'll be a speed bike in the weight room we're competing with that. We're uh, competing against the offense every day. Uh, Coach Boss brings a great energy. Just the whole, I love everything about the city and playing here. Just been having so much fun and uh, just keep keep it going and, you know, keep stacking the wins. Now, do you have your celly all set for the 100th sack or is that something you'll just come up with on the fly? No, I was doing my normal celebration, really, you know, and maybe some tears or so afterwards, but... <laughs> Nothing okay, too much. Okay, you know. No. Well, here's hoping that it's going to happen this coming Saturday against Ottawa. Again, one of your many former teams. So I I, I don't know if you've got any still hard feelings over your time no, there. I don't, but, have, uh, I don't have any hard feelings anywhere, honestly. It's, <laughs> it is what it is. Like, I don't have any. That doesn't exist. That's the game of football's business. I'm not entitled to anything. No one owes me anything. I can just control what I, what I do when I play against you. <laughs> that's a, that's a great attitude i love that <laughs> i know that's, I mean, that's the best way to go about life is like you know the sooner i tell a lot of young players this the sooner you realize that you are not entitled to anything the better you are you 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 won't set yourself up to be let down by anyone and you always have that i have to work hard for everything that i have because i i'm not entitled to anything so that's just how I operate, and that's just what it is. And we're definitely getting 100 sacks this week. Oh, it's happening. The, again, it's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Whether it's first quarter, second quarter, doesn't matter. You get that sack. First quarter. Get this, get this, team, get this team back oh, in, into the playoffs, which will happen if you guys win. So we are, we are excited for that. We cannot wait. It's it's going to be exciting, man. I'm, I'm looking forward right. to it. Yeah, yep, it's going to be fun. Obviously, we, we want you to be here for years and years on end here, you know, for, you know, but if you get to that point where you could potentially run the gambit of all the CFL teams and be a member of every single CFL team and do it, pull a Kevin Glenn, basically. Have you, have you, has that ever thought, you ever thought about that and considering how many teams that you've played for in the CFL? I haven't thought about it, but uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it here in Montreal. We'll see what happens. Who knows? Maybe like whenever that time comes and I retire, I'll call Hamilton up and say, yo, let's sign a one-day contract so I can run the tour. Then we'll see what happens. Because I was going to say, like, be, before this year, before you signed with us, we, we, we have, couldn't help but notice, like, okay, the only teams you haven't been a member of was Montreal and Hamilton. Now that you're a member of the Alouettes, now we're thinking, okay, 
maybe like way down the road, you can go with Hamilton. Like you said, one day contract. I'm okay with that. But yeah, exactly. Let's, let's, get, a, let's get a couple great cups first. We can't let let's Kevin Clint be the only guy. He'd be the only guy that's played for every team. In the <laughs> exactly. So, that's what that's what I plan on doing right there. And that's you're the first guy to hear that. Whenever I'm done, I'm not done for a while. But whenever I'm done, I'm gonna plan to sign with Hamilton a one day contract. <laughs> if you know. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, but you know, that'd be pretty funny though. Pretty cool. It, yeah. it really would. So you heard it here, here you heard it here first, folks. Sean Lennon yeah. will one day sign with the Hamilton Tiger Cats, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> not tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> so b- before we let you go, Sean, we want to at least ask, I know you, you, you've played in Montreal for, you know, b- before coming here and being a part of the Alouettes Nation. Um, now that you're living here in Montreal, uh, what what are the things that stand out to you uh, about the city the most? Where where do you like going? Uh, is anything uh, that the food, uh, the food here is really good? Yeah. Um, I was really surprised at like I knew the fan base was was really good, but I was really surprised at how loud the games are. Like the games are extremely loud. Uh, there's a lot of fans. There's a lot of energy in the city. They come out and support the team, which is really good. So. Yeah, I have the zero complaints. I actually enjoy everything about it. I know it sounds really cliche, but I'm very happy with my decision. Any uh, any any certain uh, food spots that you, that you go to on on the daily? Uh, no, I usually cook my own food, but when I do go out, uh, I don't I don't know any places offhand. It's just I like to try different things. So I like seafood. So yeah, just whatever I find on Google. We, we got to ask the, the 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 actual question here, Cliff. Uh, Sean, have you ever tried poutine, and do you like it? Well, it's not poutine. I've heard great things about it, but it's not in my it's not in my diet right now. Okay. <laughs> not, you know, you guys don't want me to start doing that because it's like <clears throat> it's like giving a little kid a piece of candy. It's probably just that good. If I try it once, I don't think I'll be able to stop. So best thing I can do is just not try it. When we win the Grey Cup, I'll try it after that. Hey, there we there go. you go. You, how about eating Putsin out of the Grey Cup? How, how, how does that sound? Yeah, that would that'd be dope. I think that'd be the first time. I don't know. But I think it'd be the first time done. And I'd, I'd do that. Yeah. All right, then. We, we, as if you didn't have enough goals for the, this season, then I've got now one more. <laughs> exactly. What are you going to do? Yeah, I'm going to eat Putin out of the Grey Cup. Hey, but you know what? It's still going to be the Grey Cup. That's all that matters. So Exactly. Uh, uh, good. All right. Go ahead and take us home, Cliff. All right. Well, Sean, once again, we are so excited for you to get your 100th sack, hopefully against the Ottawa Red Blacks this coming Saturday. Just so you know, there is a fan bus that's going to Ottawa, so you know you're going to have a lot of your supporters with you as well as you reach that incredible goal. So uh, before we let you go, let us know where we can find you on social media. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, guys. You can find me on Twitter at, what's that, S Lemonator, uh, and on Instagram at The Lemonator. And uh, that's really all I have, honestly. Well, I have that new thing. Um, I can't remember the name of the thread, but I haven't logged in or sent out anything on there. So, yeah. all right. Well, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, you know him now. Mm-hmm. Give him a follow. Show him the love for crying out loud. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Lemon. Sean, thank you so much again for joining us here on the Yellowwoods Flight Deck. We appreciate you, and we're looking forward to seeing you this coming Saturday against the Ottawa Red Blacks. No problem. Thanks for having me. And like, I don't know if you heard the first part of the interview, but I am getting a massage right now. That's why <laughs> the camera angle is where it is right now. Thank you. Oh, it's all good, man. You, you, yeah. you get yourself right, and we will see you on Saturday. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for having me. Again, I can't stress enough, Cliff, that people need to go and watch the <laughs> the video version of this interview and it, it's funny this this is the one that we are premiering as our first ever video interview uh for the Alouette's flight deck uh, YouTube page. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> and boy did we, we couldn't have asked for a better debut to this yeah. format. We we can't say and it doesn't make I know if you guys are listening to this on uh, again as we said earlier if you're listening to this on audio it, there's no e- there's no point in explaining it, you if you heard what he said during the interview, he explained it, but you have to see it to put context to it. And all I can say is head over to the YouTube channel, one, uh, our YouTube channel, once it's up, 
We'll put it on our, all of our socials too. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but either way, it was fun. To, it was fun to have him. Oh, hundred percent. Just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful individual to talk to. Uh, so thankful to be able to have the opportunity to speak with him and, you know, Definitely. Anytime he wants to come onto the flight deck and, and, and join us to talk football, because we barely scratched the surface. I mean, we, we, you know, we got, we got a lot out of him, but I mean, mm-hmm. there's, there's still so much more I and mean, there's a lot more of the story to be told. So I'm hoping that we can get Sean on again to, you know, expand upon a lot of his time in the Canadian football league and in other leagues that he's played in. And just his overall perspective on football is second to none. Like I said, we, we are extremely thankful to have someone like that playing for the Montreal Alouettes and, once again, we were, we thank you, Sean, for coming on to the flight deck and joining us this evening. Definitely, yeah. definitely appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. Um, another two couple bits of of uh, news that you want to talk about before we get to the preview of the game itself, Cliff. I know that there's one specific one specific transaction that you wanted to talk about, uh, and uh, first to chat a little bit a little bit about it, right? Mm. Uh, well, this past Monday, uh, we're, we're all reveling in such a, a great win over Calgary and looking forward to making the trip to Ottawa to play the Red Blacks, knowing that playoff implications are on the line. And we got dropped a whole bunch of news. Well, we got a, a bombshell dropped on us that uh, the Alouettes had released defensive lineman Jamal Davis. And we're going, what? I beg your pardon? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Considering he had started the week prior, he had started versus Calgary. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And uh, arguably one of the the top players in 2022 and even in 2023 was still making his presence felt, which as I just finished saying earlier, like this defensive line has been outstanding this year. And Jamal has been a, a, a focal point of that as well. Uh, what really threw us for a loop was that, and he actually clarified this on his uh, X account was that he asked for his release. Like, which, why? Uh, which added more to it. We, we wanted to know the tea. We wanted it spilled. We, yeah. Like, okay. And I'll, I'll, it was a little cryptic in the sense that he just put a hashtag of know your worth. So this, the only th- the only conclusions we can draw from this is that, Maybe he was asked to take a pay cut, and he's like, nah, not doing that. Can't blame him. He just became a father. So, I mean, <laughs> let's face it. Kids are not cheap. Let's see, you know, he, he, he signed for a certain amount, and he wants to be paid a certain amount. So, he, if you're, I guess if you're not going to give that to him, if you're, if you're going to make him take, take a pay cut, then he's going to take his talents elsewhere. And unfortunately, he did. He ended up uh, signing with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And less again, the 20, only less than twenty four hours later, yeah, ish, and, ish, ish. But yeah, to to sign with your a division rival, uh, who let's let's face it, could truly use a little bit of help on that defensive line, and they're getting a stud in him. There's there's absolutely no question about that. It's just so bizarre that that he would ask for his release and then almost immediately signed with uh, arguably the biggest rival. I mean, that this is, it's, it's concerning to say the least. Uh, like I said, we can sit and speculate about this all we want as to why he had asked for his release. The only thing I can think of just based on that kind of cryptic hashtag was that he was probably asked to take a pay cut, uh, especially when you consider we were just talking about Lawal Ugalak playing outstanding football and, you got Ugalak, you got uh, Brock Gowanlock, uh, both young, talented Canadian players, no doubt. Mm-hmm. Then you got Amando Sewell, Sean Lemon also on this line, Mustafa Johnson, all top tier players as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to say that Jamal got lost in the lost in the mix, so to speak, but I mean, maybe just maybe the Alouettes felt okay. Well, we've got all this talent already. Can't keep them all. Uh, can't pay them all too, uh, you know, the big money. So they probably came, they probably went to Jamal and said, listen, this is a situation. We need you to take a pay cut. And probably said, no, nah, no, not doing that. <laughs> no, sir. Not doing that. And anyway, I can't and we, blame him. 
Yeah, we and again, this, this all speculation on our part. So I mean, it's but you and I have you and I have amused in the past couple of weeks when it came to the additions of Sankey, and with Sean Lemon, that there may have been some there. There was more money being spent, and it makes me wonder. Obviously, if that was one of the, uh, if it was a pay cut that he was asked to take, if that was one of the reasons why he was asked to take the pay cut. Also makes me wonder too how close how close are we to the salary cap, and or knowing this, uh, who do we have coming off the sixth game that maybe we may have to pay for? Not necessarily on offense, a defense it could easily be on somebody on offense. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. all scenarios, those are all scenarios that that it could easily be. But I think yeah, you and I are in the same boat about this. I think it, again, we we haven't spoken to Jamal, so we we don't know. We don't know, but when, but yeah, but when people who could truly, go ahead. No, no. The only people who could truly speak to this are Danny Machocha and Jamal Davis, Mm -hmm. and I haven't heard anything from from either one of those two. And as a result, all we can do is speculate. As you said, we can we can assume this is what it is. We don't like to assume necessarily, but until we hear otherwise, until we actually hear from one of them saying, okay, this is the reason why Jamal Davis is no longer a Montreal Alouette. All we can do is just take a look at the, look at the scenario, look at read the, see the writing on the wall, however you want to phrase it. But ultimately he's now in Hamilton and uh, we move forward. That's Thanks. all. That's all we can do at this point. We, we would certainly wish him well, like I said, great dude. And we'll, and we'll tell uh, him that in the, in the last Alouette's home game when, when he's in town for, with absolutely. Hamilton. So yeah. And uh, yeah, wish him all the best. I mean, except for when he's playing Montreal, of course. But <laughs> you know, I, yeah. listen, he, he did what he had to do. The Montreal Alouettes did what they had to do. We we move forward. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, the Alouettes announcing it, it did happen today, but at least want to at least mention it uh, that the Alouettes uh, did partner with the Mohawk Council of Gana, of Ganawagi, um, where a couple of players. Uh, Decroix, Mac, KJG, uh, Frederic Chagnon, uh, or all had a, a a meet and greet of some sorts when uh, over in Ganawagi. Um, for for those of you who don't know, that is uh, that is the reserve over on the south shore of Montreal. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, if anybody knows the Montreal on the South Shore, if you head over the Mercier Bridge, you'll be heading over over in that direction, heading over towards Chattagay, Quebec. That's that's the direction that you're heading. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are able to partner them, obviously, with, with the upcoming um, Day of Reconciliation on Saturday. Um, that they wanted to partner again, and this is what they need to do. This is just reaching out and getting it out into the community. You know, I think whether this was part of the, the you know National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. Just for that, it's another, it's another stepping stone of bringing some more people into the into Alouette's nation, and I think they just did. You know, obviously, it's a great initiative, Cliff. Um, and again, it's it gets the Alouettes out into the uh, out into the public. Agreed, and it's also part of the uh, league wide initiative as well to recognize the indigenous communities that the. All, all nine CFL cities are a part of. Uh, I mean, let's face it, this this nation of ours was completely indigenous at one point. Mm-hmm. And now that the the, uh, the Canadian Football League and its its cities are taking part in helping to help, I guess, uh, shed a light, if you will, on the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, we're seeing a lot of these initiatives. Uh, you're, we're seeing a lot of the teams too, also indigenizing their logos. And uh, uh, I believe on Saturday, every team that's playing is going to be wearing uh, uh, orange and white jerseys in, in recognition of this. And they will also be available via a science auction afterwards. Yeah, for is, pregame, uh, they're wearing them for pregame warmups. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry, yeah. I should make that clear. Yes, it's yeah. for the for the warmups. They'll be wearing these jerseys, and then they'll be auctioned off for uh, for charities. And uh, just an absolutely fantastic initiation, uh, uh, the, it, initiative, I should say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's definitely something that, you know, I, I'm i a big fan of. I, I definitely think that this is something that uh, behooves everybody to to be a part of. And especially when it comes down to education more than anything else. Because there's, there's still a lot of people that just simply don't understand what 
this state is all about. Mm -hmm. And if it takes a CFL team to go out into the indigenous community and, you know, as I say, reach one, teach one, like to help understand as well on their perspective, what they need to do to help make things better and to help have that understanding for everybody. It's a great initiative and something that I definitely am pleased to see that all nine CFL cities and their teams are, are a big part of. Yeah. I like the way you put that reach one, teach one that I love how that, I love how that sounds. It's it's yeah. I, I really like that. Um, and this is this is still a relatively new thing, the the National Day of uh, Truth and Reconciliation, and there's still a lot of people who are like, well, I, I why are we doing three. this? I think it's year three. It, it doesn't it, matter. Actually, you know, it doesn't matter how many years it is. It really doesn't matter how many years it is. It the main thing is is that it is a thing. It, it's and, a thing. It, 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 it's something that needed to be a thing. So. Yes, and it's it's an opportunity to help people understand. And you know, you ask, well, why do we have this day? Why do we have this why are we celebrating this like well it, this is the opportunity and if you have to do it through if it has to come through football through canadian football in order to understand what this day is all about so much the better this is a great opportunity for everybody involved to to learn and grow so yeah definitely a, a as i said a, a wonderful initiative and one that i'm looking forward to seeing in person as well as the alouettes and the ottawa red blacks take the field at tv place on saturday because we're going to be seeing both teams in those uh, warm-up uniforms and mm -hmm. they can raise some money for, for charity as well. So much the better. Yeah, exactly. Um, the practice report was interesting this week. You know, I was talking to you earlier and I don't know if it was a CBA thing or not cliff, but you know, the Alouettes only had two days of practice this week, considering that, you know, even though that they're, they had their game on Saturday. I know they had a travel day back and maybe that, maybe that works into it or something like that, but I'm surprised they had a two day week rather than a three day week for practice. Mm -hmm. But either way, the, this was, as we were taping the, the, this was the day, the Alouette's first day at practice. And, um, it, it was interesting to see who did not practice. It was then we were learned uh, that Chandler Worthy did not practice because of an ankle issue. Austin Mack has a, a thigh, and we saw we saw potentially a little tweak there during the game versus Calgary. So maybe that's what he still get you know a little bit of a nagging injury. And then also there is Cordell Rogers uh, with he did not practice either uh, because of a foot. Um, the only person we haven't that we're not haven't seen on this list in a couple of weeks, obviously, is we were expecting the return of of Reggie White Jr. Uh, it's very possible that we may have to wait a couple more weeks. Maybe there was something that we don't know about, uh, and he, he isn't a hundred percent ready, and they don't want him to push him because of that particular reason. Which because you can understand with the injury that he he had, you don't want to push any back anybody back before he comes back. A lot, and this is just speculation. All I what what happened. Uh, with Greg Ellingson, very mm -hmm. similar to, I'm guessing. We don't want that to occur. So right. um, going into this game, you know, the the Owls themselves, obviously we got the, the fan the fan bus coming in. Um, the game starts at 4 o'clock. This is, this is a, we, we talked about it before, where this is a, a, a these, these next two games, the home and home series versus the Red Blacks, are games that, Especially with the the opportunity of where they are within the playoff standings, because with a win they will clinch a playoff spot. They won't clinch mm -hmm. second place because it depends on what happens with the uh, uh, with the uh, Tiger Cats uh, this past, this next week. Um, but the Owls can't sleep on these two games at all because we we've, we've seen. I think just as, as as just as early as what three years ago, three seasons ago, that the Red Blacks basically knocked the Alouettes back when when it came to a, a playoff spot, you know, because they they lost in the last game of the regular season at home to them. They yeah, and in the history and I yeah and I and I can't keep mentioning it too. You can't you can't forget Canada Day oh, way back when. You, the Owls cannot look past the Red Blacks, even for a second, considering that they have them back to back. And considering where they are in a playoff race, no. And one thing we can't forget too is that the Alouettes have not swept the Red Blacks in a regular season series since 2014, which was the first year of the Ottawa Red Blacks when they went two and sixteen. They were the expansion team. They played like an expansion team, and that was it. But ever since then, 
Ottawa, for the most part, has had their number. Now, over the past couple of years, like I'd say within the past three, four years, yeah, things have not been good in Ottawa, but still managed to win at least one of those games, whether it's a three-game series or a four-game series like it has mm-hmm. been in the past couple of years. With both games being split equally at TD Place and at Personal Molson Stadium. Yeah, Montreal has won the season series for the most part, but it wasn't a, com- a complete sweep. And this Ottawa team, just when you think they're down and out and they, you know, it's a, another dumpster fire and things are bad, they go out and they win games like against, like quite handily against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Now, does that mean Saskatchewan's a bad team or maybe Ottawa's not as bad as we, we, we think they are? Is it both? Is it neither? It, it, it's so hard to tell. But as you said, Montreal cannot afford to take this game lightly. They can't afford to take next week's game, the Thanksgiving Day game, lightly either. Ideally, you want to go into TD Place where you haven't lost, I think it's eight games in a row now that the the Alouettes have won yep. in Ottawa. Yep, eight straight. You, you want to keep that streak going. You want to keep that going. You want to punch that ticket into your, you want to punch your playoff ticket ASAP. And you're right. It won't be for, it won't be a guarantee at second place, but at least make the dance, get in there, get that X next to your name to start with. And then go from there as far as whether it's going to be second place and, you know, make sure you secure that home playoff game. One thing at a time. Just get into the playoffs. That that should be Montreal's goal. I have to believe that has to be their their thought. You talk about going one and zero every week. That should be Montreal's thought: is go one and zero this week, and you get a playoff spot. Mm-hmm. Whereas Ottawa, they're they're not mathematically eliminated. No matter how bad things have been for them recently, I think they they finally ended a six game losing streak against the Rough Riders. Yep, they still are in playoff contention. Believe it or not, I mean they're not mathematically eliminated they once like calgary like edmonton they got a lot of work to do they got to have a lot of dominoes fall a certain way if they want to make it into the playoffs but they are still in contention and you better believe that they're you you take a look at the first two games the two other games that were played this year montreal barely won those games i mean it was not a blowout it was not like it wasn't like they were manhandling these guys i mean ottawa plays this montreal team extremely tough yeah. And you could almost say that they were very lucky to win that last game uh, with that uh, last second Caleb Evans f- uh, touchdown run. I mean, by by all rights, Ottawa should have won that game. And I'm very surprised they didn't. I mean, they're going to have to be thinking about that as well this coming Saturday. And if only to keep their faint pay- playoff hopes alive, they're going to come full bore at this, at this Alouette's team. And, all you can hope for, Alouette's Nation, you know, you, you, you're, you're packing a bus full of fans to come to Ottawa to see the game. You want to play hard for them. You want to you want to show them that they didn't waste their time and their money on on this adventure. Simply put, the Alouettes have they, they cannot overlook this team. They cannot look past them. You have to be in the moment, just like you were against Calgary. I think they were truly in the moment at that time. And look what happened. They played an outstanding game. They won convincingly. There's no reason why they can't do that again against Ottawa. It's you, you, you know what the pl- you know what the plan is. You know what the the formula is. So you just have to go out and execute. Simple as that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the line has been fluctuating a little bit for this game itself, Cliff. Uh, the Alouettes are currently a two point favorite, um, uh, with the over under of forty eight points. Um, but this, I mean. Ottawa has some guys coming back. I mean, they got you know they got Money Hunter coming back. They got uh, Javon Santos Knox coming off the sixth game. So they have some of their guys back uh, that haven't been around in a while. So the, they'll be up for them, obviously returning. So it's again the the these these are games that the Owls can't sleep on. Uh, obviously, this will be you know they've gone back and forth when who's who's going to be starting a quarterback. It'll be Cody's turn this time in Ottawa. So. Um, again, they just need to stay the course, play 60 minutes. We expect the defense to just to play balls to the wall and just, I, I would not be surprised if this is a high scoring game. I really would not be surprised. It, it could turn into a show very easily. I mean, Dustin Crum, I, I still think a lot of people, they're expecting a lot out of this kid. And during that six game losing streak, he had lots of, you know, so, you know, flashes of brilliance, but 
ultimately still couldn't get the job done. And the guy's dangerous with his feet, simply mm-hmm. put. I mean, we, we saw what Kadeem Carey did with the Alwoods run defense last week. And, you know, they kept Carey honest for the most part, but he was still able to get a couple of really good runs in. And you can't do that against Dustin Crum. You can't do that against, I think it's Deontay Williams, their running back. I mean, the, that's a guy too that given the opportunity can really break one out and simply put like, I, I think this game is going to be one in the trenches. It's going to be the ground, the ground game for, of Montreal versus the ground game of Ottawa. Mm-hmm. Who's is going to be better. And I, I think if William Stanback, uh, Josh went we get a chance to run rush out over this red blacks defense. I think they will. I, I think uh, they're going to try and bait Cody into, you know, making those home run shots again. And if that's the case, he just maybe will very well get picked off because Ottawa's defense, like they're, they're, they're secondary. They've looked a little rough at times, but I mean, against, uh, against Saskatchewan last week, they, they looked pretty damn good. So you, I, I think it really just comes down to doing what you did to get, like you did against Calgary, just taking care of the ball, manage the game. If you have to, it, it's boring as heck. You know, I understand you want to make those highlight plays. If you're Cody Fajara, you want to, make those amazing throws, but sometimes, you know, just dink and dunk your way to, to a win. I mean, it's, it's boring. It's not exciting, but if you, if you're, if you're trying to get that win, you're trying to lock up that playoff spot, you gotta do what you gotta do. And, and simply put, I don't think it, if Cody can just limit the mistakes, focus on spreading the ball around and getting his, his running game going, getting his, his backfield guys, some yards and getting them moving. That's going to be massive. I think that's really going to be, that'll, that'll truly be the key. I think this game is going to be won and lost on the ground. Re, the, the team that has the better run attack, I think is going to be the one that comes away with the win on Saturday. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. 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 It's going to be, a, it's going to be a fun game. Nonetheless, I know we have, we have a lot of people from Alouette's nation heading to the game. Uh, we will see if you're going to be at the game, come, you know, shout out to us on social media. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, you know, maybe meet up, uh, but we will be there at TD place um, to, uh, to cheer on the Alouette's um, from the stands. Uh, do not forget also too for the next episode of flight deck live. Uh, we will be on the field uh, post game uh, from uh, from TD TD Place Field. Um, also, um, uh, again, we we can't thank enough Sean Lemon for joining us for this episode because uh, uh, first it's our first ever video interview that you guys will be seeing, um, mm-hmm. and two just just getting some new guys from the team. It's it's just a, a it's just so much fun speaking to a lot of these guys that we haven't spoken to before. So uh, and, again, and th- we cannot, thanks, Sean. And we cannot overstate. This Saturday will be the opportunity for Sean Lemon to get his 100th quarterback sack. And as we said in the interview, truthfully, it's not a matter of if he will do it; it's when. And, and he called. He called it when. He called it. He said when. He said when. He did. He did. So he called his shot, and I, for his sake, I sincerely hope so. Uh, just being able to 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 hit that uh, illustrious mark of 100 quarterback sacks is fantastic, and you know we'll be we're gonna be cheering him on we're gonna be looking for him to to make that mark and you know let that lead towards the alouettes clinching that playoff spot and you know just keeping this keeping this thing going because i mean this it's it's that time of year folks these games matter they truly do and you start to see the winners from the losers you you start to see the who wants it versus who thinks they want it so Mm -hmm. I think the Elowitz want it, and I think they're going to do what it takes to show that they want it, and they're going to go and they're going to get that win. Yeah, simply put, uh, that. Yeah, make sure that you also stay tuned to our socials. We will be releasing the uh, that your chance to win a, a pair of uh, seats via our our sponsor uh, Sport Buff. So the uh, Sport Buff flight crew seats. Uh, make sure you check that out. We're doing it early because obviously with it coming up on Thanksgiving, we want to make sure that we give enough. Uh, people have time enough to make plans for Thanksgiving Monday. Um, and again, too, if you win, you get to come on by the uh, the first ever fan meetup. Uh, can't get any be- can't get any better than that. So stay tuned on our socials for that. If you want to reach out to us and suggest things, let us know how we're doing, et cetera, you can email me at tim.capper at 
alouettesflightdick.ca or email cliff at cliffyd.pine at alouettesflightdick.ca. Um, again, dude, uh, appreciate you. Obviously, we'll be on, uh, it'll be a road trip this week for the Alouettes Flight Deck, and we'll see. I'll see you, and we'll see you, the fans, there at TD Place. But if not, we will see you uh, for our post game for Flight Deck Live, or we will see you next week. Or, uh, we'll speak to you next week on the uh, on the next episode of the Alouettes Flight Deck. So for everybody here at the Alouettes Flight Deck for Cliffy D, I'm Tim Capper. Run final approach. <laughs>